Hello everybody, I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research and I'm uh, joined today on my Zcast by Jose Tolado, who is an HPE fellow, uh, which I think is just a really cool way of saying you run the AI Ops program here at Aruba, correct? That's correct. So uh, just give us a quick intro on what you do here, uh, the role you play at Aruba and how that's used in the broader uh, HPE organization. Okay, so what we do is we collect telemetry, inventory config from all our customers and we try to figure out AI ops type techniques to make the customers have better service. So you're the AI guy with the guy with the big brain. So uh, obviously, you know, given your title and given what you do, we're going to be talking AI and networking and AI ops, which is uh, an emerging field. I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, before I get started, though, I do want to give a quick shout out to eWeek. eWeek is my media partner. All Zcasts are done in conjunction with the eWeek eSpeaks program. So uh, before we get into AI ops, let's... Uh, Talk about the last couple of years, right? So we talk a lot about how everything's changed in the business world. You know, we shop digitally, we watch, we, you know, attend birthday parties over Zoom, but a lot's changed for the IT pro. And I think that really hasn't been reflected in a lot of the stuff that I read in the media. So what are your customers telling you? How has their job changed? How has it gotten harder? And what are the new challenges they're facing? Okay, so clearly the new challenges are new applications are running over the network that before might have been nice to have, but now are mission critical. For example, a lot of people working from home and Zoom has to be up 99.99% of the time. Yeah. Otherwise, the meetings are very annoying if it's clicking and you keep asking, is your Zoom working? Is your Zoom working? So the number of the type of applications that are mission critical has changed. People are working less time in the office and more time from home. So obviously, we have to figure out if the home networks are also up. A lot of our medical customers have some of the doctors working from home. Mm. So it went from just checking the email from home to actually Providing Diagnosing visits from patients, home. Yeah. You have to diagnose yeah. some patients from home. So people yeah. are calling, not going into the hospital as often, especially if you're coughing, you have sore throat, you can't go in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's, what's been fascinating to me is how the role of the network has changed. Uh, when you look at, you know, every company through the pandemic decided to go through these big, big digital transformation initiatives. And if you think of the building blocks of digital transformation, cloud, mobile, IoT, you know, AI, they're all network centric, right? And so, uh, in fact, I did a survey recently where I asked uh, business leaders, uh, has the pandemic changed your view on the role of the network? And two thirds said it was now more strategic. So uh, how is that, you know, for your customer, uh, how, how have they adapted to that? So actually some of them, for example, started providing um, wraps or residential APs to some of their VIP workers to actually have end-to-end -end connectivity through Aruba. So it's actually one of the things that we've actually focused on more, which is like the micro branch, SD-WAN, and the, how is the performance inside the home in addition to how the enterprise networks are doing. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up too because those micro branches, SD-WAN, uh, connectivity to cloud, that's all cranked up the level of complexity in the network. You know, before I was an analyst, I was actually a network engineer and this was a couple of decades ago and the network was complicated then, but it's nothing compared to what it is today, correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. And so how does uh, artificial intelligence or AI help with some of these new challenges. Okay, so the, the main thing is actually collecting all the data in one single place, and that includes all the configuration of the network, the topology of the network, all the states, stats, events, all in one place. Um, of course, we aggregate all our customers' data together, all the metadata, of course, nothing on the payload side, so that we could find trends of configurations that work for some customers, but we're not working for others, some things that could be wrong in the topology, in the config, what software versions they're running, so we could quickly figure out um, needle in a haystack type problems. And, um, and so talk to me about, you brought up the term data, the, the importance of the data lake that you have because you know, in, in data sciences there's an expression that says good data leads to good insights. Well the corollary is true, bad data leads to bad insights and fragmented data leads to partial insights. And I know a lot of your competitors uh, have product portfolios that exist in their own silos and so the data is not really fully integrated so you might get uh, a good view of what's going on in the Wi-Fi network, but not in the data center or not in the WAN. And so uh, talk about the importance of the data lake and then how Aruba is actually managed to create a single data lake. So yes, that is correct. We have a yeah. single data lake. It has all information around APs, switches, gateways, controllers, all in one single place. But because everything is managed by the cloud, we have all the config, we have the topology, we know their sites, we know how the devices are placed within the topology and the network and the sites and how they're talking to each other. So we have a 360 degree view of what's going on. Yeah, and you, you had mentioned this, but again, I think it's worth reiterating that you're, it's not only on a per customer 
all the data from one customer, but you're actually aggregating data from all your customers, correct? Yes, yes, yes. All the customers are aggregating one single data lake. So if we can actually see that some customers having 20% higher performance than another, we could actually figure out what features are common, what features are different. Is it a config difference? Is it a density problem? Is it an environmental problem? Is it a client problem? So we could actually, since we have information around clients and devices and topology and config, we could narrow down what is the reason why one customer is performing at a different metric than another one. And have your customers been open to that? Do they worry about the security of having their data shared with their competitors? Maybe? So the only the metadata is shared. For example, what configuration knobs you have turned on and turned off, what features you have turned on and turned off. But that's all anonymized. The model doesn't care the name of the customer. It just knows that there's a customer with a certain TID that has this AP model, this switch model, this topology, this config, and these are all the states and stats coming in. There's no information around clients or what applications or what payload they're running. It's yeah, anonymized. And, and so to me, what you're doing there um, really takes the value of the cloud and brings some unique capabilities. I know uh, early on when you moved Aruba Central to the cloud, uh, you know, in, in fact, when cloud management came, there was a lot of debate about whether you really needed cloud management or not. And I think the, once you have that ability to aggregate all that data, now customers are able to compare to what their you know, best practices with some other companies or what other kind of customers are like them are doing. And so, uh, are your customers taking advantage of those things? Yes, they are. We actually, if you look at our current list of about 40 different AI-based models in our product, um, some are around baselining yourself against other customers that have similar environments. Some environments mean similar device types, different client types, similar applications, similar um, densities, and for example, how strong the signal propagates in your environment. And when we baseline your, how you're doing, if you have outdoor APs, we'll compare against other customers that have similar outdoor-like behavior. And if you have a dense office space, we'll compare against others that have similar office density with similar AP model, similar client mixture. So when we baseline your network, it's not against a random Wi-Fi network, it's against a network that's very similar in features to yours. Do, do the results surprise them sometimes? Yes. Yeah. Because if you just had a common baseline, for example, outdoor APs fail much more than indoor APs just because the signal strength yeah. is weakened, there's much more clients, there's much more roaming. So you don't want to just have a baseline that's just vanilla. You want to have a, if you have an office space, you want to compare against office space. It's not a mixture of, in the outdoors, you don't want to compare against an office space. So it's very important that a baseline is correct for your environment. Yeah, it's always been my experience too that companies always seem to have an overly inflated view of how well their network runs. And when they compare them to their peers, they realize that there's a lot of room for improvement. Of, is that what you've seen as well? Yes, and of yeah. course, you could be better than peers in some areas and worse in others. I mean, maybe your um, speed is high, but your DCP response time is slow. So, I mean, you'll see where you stack up better or worse than peers and where you have to focus your attention. Maybe you have to work in some load balancing in some service. Yeah, well, that, that's, all, that's all great information. And I wish you had that when I was an engineer. So, uh, now let's, uh, let's, let's talk about AI. Uh, AI is kind of a a funny term in that there's a lot of people scared of it, right? There's a lot of trepidation. We've all watched the movies, I guess, where our systems become self-aware or whatever, but uh, put that aside. Uh, is, it, is it ready for production today? Because I, I know uh, AI systems aren't perfect, right? And, and sometimes they make mistakes and that scares customers. But mm -hmm. where, where do you feel we are on this AI journey? Or is it really ready for prime time? So it's feature by feature, use case by use case, as you mentioned earlier around the self-driving car. I mean, cars don't self-drive themselves, but they yeah. do some things well. They don't do some things not so well. If you get cut off from a left lane, you're trying to cross your life, it's not going to do it. Yeah. Um, but same thing applies to, to this use case. So what happens is every time we build a model, we know how accurate it is, and we know the worst case, how poorly it does, and we have expert guardrails. So if a model has high accuracy, it has good guardrails, and in the worst case scenarios, it doesn't do anything stupid, <laughs> yeah. then we would deploy that model in self-driving mode. If a model has 80% accuracy and the 20% that is not accurate is, is a little dangerous, we'll put it in human-assisted AI assist, I mean, AI mode, where you, we give you all the information, we'll tell you 80% sure this model is going to work, and these are the reasons why, and these are the outliers, and do you want to apply it or not? So some models still need a human to check the output before saying go. Yeah, and I think what's important there to understand is that uh, a true AI system takes that good data and bad data and use that to refine the, the learning algorithms. And so it does get better over time. And that, that I think is an important part for you watching to help you understand whether somebody is really AI or not, right? Because there's a lot of rules-based systems where the, the vendor claims to be AI. And by the uh, way, there's mixtures too, where yeah. you could have an AI, AI system, but you could protect it with some rules just to make sure it keeps it within a bounding box where the model, you don't let it go anywhere it wants to go, just constrain it. So yeah, you so, can do a mixture. So to me, the barrier to entry though, 
of whether you should deploy AI or not is, is the AI system more accurate than people, right? And people make a lot of mistakes. And in fact, uh, my research shows that uh, for downtime, human error still is the largest cause of it, right? So uh, by using an AI system, even if you cut the errors in half, right, that's still a big win. And to me, that would be an AI system that's relatively immature. And we right? give you confidence intervals. So yeah. if we're more confident than a human, we'll say you could hit the button. If we're not as sure as a human, then let a human check. So yeah. it's all over, it's different levels of But the key is that it does get better over time. Yes, and eventually, it does. It does. even if it's not more confident than a human today, you would be in the future. So yes, it gets better because our models get better, yeah. because the data gets bigger, and all these reasons it gets better, yes. Yeah, so the, the vision of, of AI, and, and uh, we were talking about this pre-recording, and actually you referred to it already as the model of the car, I've always used is it's a little bit like the vision of the autonomous vehicle. Right? So somewhere in the future, we'll be jumping into cars that have no driver and no controls, and we'll have full confidence that it'll get us to where we want to go. Mm -hmm. Nobody does that today. <laughs> but there are a lot of features in cars, um, autopilot, parallel park assist, um, you know, lane change alert that make us better drivers. Right? And so from that standpoint, uh, AI provides a valuable role in keeping us safe and making sure we get to where we want to go without actually taking over the whole car. Mm -hmm. So what are some of those, the analogies to that, the network side, what are those lane change alerts and parallel park assists of the networking industry that we can take advantage of today, but still keep an eye on full, auto, full autonomous networking in the future? Okay, so there's a lot of config knobs that optimize the way APs behave in the environment, where the models are more accurate than people right now. Because people will typically... Probably far more accurate than people, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Because people will typically do some sniffer checks, check a few APs, and just say, oh, I think this config is a little better for that config for this specific part of the building. They clearly cannot check the whole building. They're not going to go through logs of one week worth of data of every single client, every single AP. They cannot possibly do that. So the models are going to be more accurate than a person trying to optimize a bandwidth, a power, an AX, um, which clients could support what features models can do better than them. Um, so we have things around detecting passerby classification to exclude passerbys from connecting for your more office space um, APs. That's self-driving right now. There's a button right now. You click OK, it'll just self-drive. Mm. It gets a week worth of data. It checks every single client, every single AP in your building, and it finds a config that's better than a human is going to do. Um, we have things around optimizing different RF parameters. It's also better than a human. Yeah. Um, and then things around finding anomalies relative to baseline is better than human because human doesn't have a patient to look at dashboards. Yeah. It's mostly a patient's problem. If they were looking at dashboards, they could probably do better than an anomaly detector by looking at the shape. Um, so those are examples where it's better than a human. Yeah, to me, the, you mentioned a lot of Wi-Fi related things in there. I think even still today, even though the system has gotten better, Wi-Fi troubleshooting remains the hardest thing for network engineers to do, especially with people at home, because nobody really understands why Wi-Fi doesn't work it just it was working five minutes ago, and now it isn't now. So, in fact, uh, one of the interesting data points in my research is that uh, the average network engineer who works on Wi-Fi spends 25% uh, of their time, that's over a day a week, doing nothing but Wi-Fi troubleshooting. Right. So if you can help with that, I mean, you give a ton of time back. So. And yes, they have, and the people complaining is already a little peak of the iceberg. There's a lot of people having issues that don't bother complaining because they can never produce a problem, and if they go to the IT person and say, it doesn't work here, by the time they come back, it's working. So it's like... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you have something that's running 24-7, it finds all those little problems. And it's those, those things I feel like they're never producible, they're just conditions that you can never produce, but it's actually still an underlying yeah, problem. Yeah, in fact, I find. was talking with the, a, a little while ago with a network engineer that ran uh, uh, the Wi-Fi network in the school system. And he said when the, the, the Wi-Fi had been down for a couple of days, and he asked one of the teachers, why didn't you say anything, right? And the person said, the teacher said, it just, I just thought that's the way Wi-Fi was, <laughs> right? And so we have this overly low impression of what Wi-Fi is, but I think it could be a lot better, and certainly AI would do that, so. Yes. Uh, now, I know uh, you've recently made some announcements uh, around uh, AI ops. Can you go through what those are? Okay, so as you said earlier, we keep improving all our models, and we have like 40 in production, and everyone is getting better because we refine them, we track them, make sure there's metrics, and then we get better data sets. But then the new things we introduced in the last couple of months are around client insights, um, every one of our devices, switches, gateways, APs, controllers, has fingerprint and the flow information of every single client that's served by that networking device. So without any extra license or any extra gear, just from the APs, the switches, and gateways, we collect all these fingerprints and then we could classify clients, endpoint devices connecting to our networking entities with 99% coverage. 
Um, before, we used to have a separate collector that would actually subscribe to flows and do the classification. Now it's all built in line. Um, our switches, gateways, and APs have DPI capabilities, so we know what flows are being running. Again, we don't, it's only metadata. We just know the type of flows, yeah. and, and we could figure out from the device behavior whether it's, for example, a personal iPad or a point of sales iPads, right? I mean, iPads, people use them uh -oh. also for like, go to Subway and buy something, it could be an right. iPad. So we could classify devices, we have about 300 different labels, and then we could classify the behaviors. For example, is it somebody carrying an iPad or an iPad that's stuck on a, on a wall that people just type on? So that got introduced, and that has two benefits. Actually, about three benefits. One is around just information about what, when the device fails, you know what device it is, go chase it. One is around, is the behavior changing? For example, if a device got hacked and it's starting to do flows that it's not supposed to. And then if you want to put policies, if you want a certain device class, you want it to just do certain things, you could restrict policies. But it also gives benefits to all the network optimization insights because as I mentioned earlier, when you're trying to optimize your network for performance, it's also good to know what clients you have in your environments. It's different to optimize a network for IOTs than it is to optimize it for MacBooks or is it to optimize it for iPhones. There's different ways of configuring a network to optimize mobile versus fixed devices, for example. So that's the client insights type um, category. Then there's the firm recommender, which is a ML model based recommender. What's happening in our industry, people usually are reluctant to upgrade software because they're always afraid that something may happen when they upgrade. So people typically run software that's one plus year old. Yes because <laughs> they're afraid to upgrade. Yes. So we have data-driven upgrade recommendations. Again, we still don't have the button to just automatically upgrade every week or two, but basically it has popularity matrix around how many clients, how, how long they're staying in that software, upgrades, downgrades, information. It's, it's perfect for machine learning. So in addition to having popularity metrics, it has things about what we know from the engineering side. All our internal JIRA database knows exactly each problem, each problem each software version what problems it has with, with clients, all the interoperability problems. So we take all that information, plus all the popularity of what people are doing in the wild, and it recommends the best firmware for you based on your environments. So if you're running a code that's like one year old, we crank the machine and say, hey, you should run on this one from like a month and a half ago. It's very safe. Customers like you have it, and it's working great for them. So are, you, are your customers finding the client insights useful for the rise of IoT devices that, that I'm seeing? That's one example. Yeah. For example, um, IoTs, they usually want to have a more restrictive policy. So some of our bigger customers, like some of these retail ones that have 2,000 to 10,000 stores and they have some IoT devices and it's very painful for them to have rules around MAC addresses and vendor names to restrict cameras, IoT well, things. Well, often the network engineer doesn't even know what IoT devices are there, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. We will find them for them. And yeah. then you could say, just put this policy for all these IoTs versus them searching through MAC addresses and searching and figure out where the camera MAC addresses are. And, whether. and yes, some things they don't even know what they are. Well, most companies mm -hmm. have really no visibility because what you wind up with a lot of operational technology uh, being put in there. In fact, I talked to one company that redesigned their building for hybrid work, and they instituted a bunch of cameras, environmental sensors, things like that. And the CIO there told me they have more OT devices than IT devices now, right? So that's that's a big change that's coming to companies. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for that update, Jose. Uh, last question for you. Uh, what's coming from a roadmap perspective? What can customers expect to see with your AI platform in the future? Okay, so a lot of it is evolution. Just as we get more comfortable with the models, is push more feature into um, human tested and accepted to more automation features. I assume that's just a constant stream. That's feed. constant, yeah, constant. Yeah. Every few months we just put more feature in self-driving mode yeah. and less into the human unchecked. Another main effort is around using more streaming technologies to make the more real-time-ish in the models so they could react within a couple of minutes so we could alert you and you have your fast response time to figure out where the source of the problem is quicker. Mm. Um, and the third area is around integrating our support system with our real-time uh, um, models so that we could actually use a lot of uh, label data from our support system to actually find be better root causing of the actual model recommenders. Oh, so that means IT would know about a problem before the user does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the first user that found it helps yeah. all the other users that haven't found it yet. <laughs> yeah, and that's not always the case. So anyways, that, 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 that sounds great. I mean, I, I believe AI is the future of where IT is going. I think for you watching this, if you've had some fear and trepidation of it in the past, I understand why. A lot of the systems really didn't live up to their advertised capabilities, but I think you know, your service certainly does today, so it's worth taking a look at. I'll put a link to where you can find more information on your AI platform down in the YouTube description. But other than that, Jose, thanks for joining me today. Don't forget to click to subscribe, and I'm Zia Scaravall, and I'll see you next time on Zcast.